you very much for that um, long <laughs> and um, expensive introduction. Um, so it's a real pleasure to speak to you folks today. And it's a, um, I decided I was asked to do this seminar and decided kind of late on the topic and really decided that I wanted to make this a piece that kind of followed on from the previous two seminar speakers that we'd had. So we'd had um, Bob Bowden speak to us about resistance in a kind of big picture. And then Pablo speak about stem rust. And I wanted to also speak about small grains that I work on, but wanted to give kind of a big picture, thinking maybe about some topics broader than just thinking about disease resistance for, um, for plant disease control. And so I, with that, I will start talking about this. This is mainly focused on Fusarium hepplite. And I've lost my pointer. Where does it go? OK, it's not that side. This isn't my computer, can you tell? So, okay, so I think this will work. So, um, wheat production in the US, so there are different types of wheat grown in different parts of the country with different um, end uses. And obviously we're up here in, in Minnesota where we have largely hard red spring wheat, which is what goes into making um, bread production versus the um, soft white wheats, which are grown out on the East Coast, which largely end up in um, cakes and cookies and those sorts of things. We have in North Dakota, some of the Durham wheat shown there in red, which are ultimately used in um, pasta production. And then we also have um, out on the um, Pacific Northwest, some white wheats that are produced that are also relatively um, soft wheats too, that are also going into those cakes and cookies and things like that. And then in the heart of the country, we have these um, hard red winter wheats, which are um, a large proportion of this wheat is actually export wheat as well. And so from Kansas, over 80% of their wheat is exported, whereas the vast majority of the hard red spring wheat grown in Minnesota is actually um, used domestically for bread production. So that gives you just a picture of different types of wheat. There are multiple different diseases that are important in um, Minnesota. And I just wanted to list some of the more important diseases. Um, I have, and I'm going to talk today a lot about the work we've done on Fusarium hep blight. Um, some of these other leaf diseases are important and I want you to think about those in terms of these being residue-borne diseases that um, will kind of come into the whole discussion of thinking about Fusarium hep blight. We talked about stem rust um, the last couple of weeks in seminar, a really important disease in terms of its potential impact, but leaf rust is actually far more um, common. And then the newest kind of incomer on the scene is um, bacterial leaf streak. But I'm really going to focus today talking about Fusarium hep blight. And this really, in many ways, was what precipitated my position here at the University of Minnesota. The previous small grains pathologist had um, retired, Roy Wilcoxon, and they didn't fill this position. And then in 1992, the only year there wasn't somebody in that position, we had a major epidemic um, of Fusarium hep blight. And it really is the number one limiting factor to wheat production, really in the US now. And it's certainly the epidemics that we saw in the upper Midwest overshadowed the economic impact of the wheat rust epidemics of the 30s and 50s that we kind of held up as being the, um, the examples of, of major economic impact um, from wheat diseases. Fusarium hep blight is really an important disease globally. Now it's certainly a disease that is now seen um, very much in every part um, of the world where wheat is being um, produced. So the other issue with fusarium, as many of you are aware, is that um, fusarium fungi are the most prevalent toxin producing um, fungi in the northern temperate region. So it's found throughout um, Europe and parts of Asia and um, North America, so many parts of the world. So there are a number of different species that produce mycotoxins, and um, these are regulated and affect grain marketing. So in the US, there are limitations on how much toxin can be present in grain and um, what those levels can be when it is being um, marketed, OK? So the other thing about Fusarium hep blight is that it's a really sporadic disease, but it's not a disease that we haven't seen before. And so historically, Fusarium hep blight was present. Um, and in fact, there's good reports of 
Fusarium hip blight epidemics in the southern part of Minnesota in barley crops. And we don't think of barley being produced in the southern part of Minnesota, but as the Corn Belt moved north into the southern part of Minnesota, barley production was pushed out because of toxins into the northern part of the state. And that was all done um, quite a long time ago. And something that I'll bring back um, is really the only effective time that Fusarium hep blight was controlled was from the end of the Second World War to the mid um, 1980s or so. And this really reflects the period where tractors got big enough to pull mobile plows to invert the soil layer and where, where widespread tillage was being used to remove the residues on the soil surface. And so, um, yeah, that's obviously one of the things that I want to talk about um, today as well. So, where, so we were here um, right in the upper Midwest where Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Manitoba in Canada were affected by the Fusarium hep blight epidemics that were really substantial from 93 through 96, where we estimate that at farm gate yield losses exceeded um, $2.3 um, billion. And so this was sort of the, the beginnings of a major epidemic and a major um, problem with this disease throughout the US. But it was this epidemic that occurred in the um, soft white um, winter wheat in, um, in Michigan primarily, that, which is where Kellogg's um, sources much of its wheat. And Kellogg made a decision in 96 to not source any wheat from that region, irrespective of what the level of disease was in the crop, because we didn't have mycotoxin testing in place. And they were concerned that they could get mycotoxins into their grain products, and so they just said, we're not buying wheat. Well, when the entire state couldn't sell its wheat, there was an issue. And it was really the legislative um, issues that came from that that really led to the development of the U.S. Wheat and Barley um, Scab Initiative. So since that time, we've seen kind of chronic contamination of um, some of the soft red um, winter wheat with um, deoxynivalenol and other fusarium toxins, and they have seen significant yield losses over a number of different <laughs> years. And then most recently, and this has really only happened in the last two years or so, that we have seen major fusarium hep blight epidemics popping up under center pivot irrigation in Idaho, which has been an arid kind of production environment, except they grow wheat under center pivot irrigation. And what's actually happened in Idaho is, um, there's been a huge increase in dairy production in the state, and so Chobani has put in a big plant there. Idaho has now eclipsed California in being a major producer um, of milk. And in order to feed those dairy cattle, they're growing corn. So they're now growing corn in rotation with wheat under center pivot irrigation in an arid landscape, and they're ending up with fusarium hep blight. So this has become a, an issue. So really almost all of the country, probably um, not quite so heavily hit of these export crops in Kansas um, and places, but still there has been sporadic contamination in those. So I want to get folks thinking about what um, caused this epidemic to begin with. Certainly, when we saw fusarium hep blight in Minnesota in 1993, it was a combination of factors that led to disease development. And this really should get all of you folks thinking back to the plant disease triangle that I spoke just a few weeks ago to my undergrad class about, um, but thinking about the various different factors. So one was undoubtedly weather patterns contributing to fusarium hep blight. The other one was um, susceptible um, cultivars, wheat and barley, and expanded corn production, putting out large areas of potentially susceptible hosts, and then the use of um, reduced tillage practices. And just to give you an idea of what had happened in Minnesota, is that this shows, so, the yellow, so this is years and precipitation events, the um, kind of historical averages over 30 years are shown here in the orange bars and the red bars showed what happened in 93 um, through 96. And so not only did we have peak rainfall, but it actually pushed the rainfall events from um, you know, June, which is normally our wettest month, um, as opposed to July, that July actually became the wettest month. So not only did we have more rainfall, but it pushed that rainfall to at and after anthesis as opposed to before anthesis. So con clearly contributing um, to disease. 
So something else that had happened is that the 1980s had been dry and we weren't actively breeding for plant disease resistance um, or for Fusarium heblite resistance, at least in um, the wheat varieties that were being released. And because the 1980s were dry and we weren't screening in nurseries, we weren't getting any incidental screenings of disease resistance, for disease resistance in the yield trials that the breeding programs um, you know, undertake every year to test their material. And so as a result, that there were several varieties that were really well adapted wheats and that yielded well, but did not have fusarium head blight resistance. And so we had unwittingly released a number of highly susceptible varieties that turned out to be otherwise good varieties and had become very popular. So much of our acreage was planted to susceptible varieties. Um, and then as it turned out, all of the malt barley um, cultivars, and there's generally far fewer barley varieties than there are wheat varieties at any given time. Um, so it turned out that all of the barley varieties were moderately susceptible as well. Um, and then the other thing that's happened, and this is a change that we've certainly seen in the US, but has also been reflected in other parts of the world, and I think particularly um, in, in the northern parts of Europe, they've documented this too, is that while we know there are a whole range of fusarium species that can cause fusarium head blight, that fusarium gruminiarum has become more and more the dominant one. And we're not entirely clear why that is. It could be there's a climate component to it, but it could also be that um, the corn is involved with this. But whatever the, um, the rationale for this, this is also the fusarium species that has a sexual stage and produces perithesia which um, are far more effectively spread the ascospores than perhaps the canidia for long distance dispersal. And clearly, um, the, the widespread adoption of reduced tillage practices, which was t undertaken to um, prevent soil erosion, largely, um, this occurred in the 1980s and was really taken up because of that dry period where we were trying to conserve soil moisture and that became really important. Um, and so the widespread adoption of tillage practices undoubtedly left a lot more residue um, on the plant surface. And um, corn leaves more residue per unit area than, than the other crops and that residue breaks down a little bit um, more slowly than the residues of many of our other crops, just because physically the residue is, um, is larger and therefore resists decomposition. So I want to talk now a little bit to just give you an overview of the progress that we've really made towards disease control in a number of different um, areas. And the first one is host resistance. And I think this is something where my program really played um, kind of a, a key role to begin with, which was in developing um, phenotyping systems for Fusarium head blight. And so we established from fairly small sized um, inoculated mist irrigated nurseries to large ones, and we now screen for wheat and barley in Minnesota at two locations and probably upwards of 20,000 lines for the breeding programs. Um, and we did this initially to identify susceptible varieties and to get them out of production. But you know, after that, then we looked for sources of resistance um, and, and then we were screening breeding populations, um, elite materials, and um, doing genetic studies in association with that to identify QTL that were associated with fusarium head blight and mycotoxins. So we went through all these various stages of developing um, colonized corn and macro canidia inoculum, and you've probably all seen the um, inoculated irrigated nurseries that we have out here in St. Paul, and where we rate disease and then we look post harvest at, at the um, kernels, and then um, much of the samples are sent to Yan Hong's lab um, for mycotoxin testing. And the, the wheat breeding programs have done a great job. They've identified multiple different sources of resistance, and so um, a number of these sources have come from well outside the germplasm for that the breeding programs were being used. Um, some of these sources like SUMAI-3 um, came from China, Tokai-66 from Japan, and some of those have been used quite widely in the breeding programs, and a lot of the Minnesota breeding programs now have SUMAI-3 um, base resistance in them. Fortuitously, in a lot of the um, soft red winter wheats grown on the east coast, um, they also had 
native resistance, which was just resistance that was already present in their breeding program. So they were a jump or two ahead and could utilize material within their breeding program and were able to um, move material through their breeding program without being quite as disruptive as what happened in the spring wheat program. Um, but, you know, Jim Anderson's program, along with others, made significant progress. They identified various different um, QTLs. There were diagnostic markers that were developed for those. And then the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative has developed um, these four regional genotyping centers to put to do high throughput genotyping for the breeding programs. And, and their real goal was to um, develop new market technologies and to implement those for the applications for breeding programs, okay? Um, and to take a lot of the market-assisted selection that was being done individually by breeding programs and to kind of fast track it and make it more efficient by doing it in a centralized facility. Um, and all of the plant breeding programs or the wheat and barley programs in the US have access to these four labs to run numbers of samples through. And they're focusing um, primarily on disease resistance, but they do also look at um, quality traits and some um, disease resistance traits. And of the, bre the, the breeding programs across the US, most of them are using one or more of the major um, 5QTL listed here for fusarium hair blight resistance. And so they've made good progress identifying resistance, identifying the QTLs associated with them, and integrating them um, into the breeding program. And so this is a list of varieties that was the variety trials bulletin that growers would have to select for um, in 1996. So this was in the middle of the kind of fusarium crisis. And really before um, we had done much breeding for resistance backup, which is this line um, here, which was released by Bob Bush, really in response to fusarium hair blight, was the first variety released in Minnesota that um, was released with the goal of having some improvement to fusarium hair blight. And it certainly had um, reduced toxin development but it um, and reduced disease development in the variety, but it was also, as Bob Bush would joke, yield resistant as well. So it, it <laughs> yielded pretty poorly. But you can see that we had a couple of varieties, um, 2375, which was a um, line out of the Pioneer breeding program, um, was there, but Norm, which was really one of the things that probably drove this epidemic, was a variety, um, sadly, one of the last lines that Bob Bush, who was the wheat breeder here um, at that time, had released and was a, agronomically a beautifully adapted line and really high yielding, great quality, but it was really susceptible. And this was one of the things that was probably driving um, fusarium hip blight. And so, um, we now screen on a regular basis in the breeding programs for disease resistance. And they do this in multiple different ways for fusarium hair blight. So we look at um, disease in the field. They look at um, head weight and various different kind of grain parameters, um, looking at the grain post harvest and the toxin. And we can see that, um, and then Jim does this kind of great um, integration of all of those factors to come up with a relative ranking of the varieties. And we've actually made pretty significant progress. And so now when you look at the varieties that the growers have available to them today, that we have still have a few varieties that are out there that are susceptible, but many of the most popular varieties being grown have resistance. So the breeders have really done um, a tremendous job to provide some tools, but none of these resistances are single major genes that confer immunity. All of them are QTLs. The best QTL that we have, which is the one on 3BS, confers about 26% of the resistance. Um, and so none of them are really conferring a lot of resistance and none provide immunity, which means that even the breeders can't get this disease um, down to a level where it can really be effectively controlled. So the, the thing that the breeders will, um, will tell us is to plant those varieties with um, improve resistance. We have learned the hard way that we really can't plant susceptible varieties. And I think the other thing that really relates um, that the growers have really learned is that many of the varieties differ a little bit in the heading date and planting times differ depending on the, the growing season. And the growers have learned to diversify when the varieties head, which spreads their risk of this disease, which affects the plants um, right at flowering. So um, the next piece of the puzzle is um, chemical control. And 
Um, this is something that very much like the disease resistance picture has evolved over time. So in the mid um, 1990s, we were using protectant chemicals to try and prevent um, this disease infecting the heads. So we were using mancozeb um, and systemic um, fungicides like Benamil. And that changed in the late 1990s to using some of the um, triazole, so using tilt and follicure, um, and quadris, which is a strobil urine and one of the, the newest kind of groups of fungicides. Um, and then in the 2000s, Caramba, um, and then Proline and Prosara, which is using a combination of um, prothioconazole and um, tebuconazole, which is the active ingredient of follicle. So we started playing around with those to try and get um, improved um, disease resistance. And many of these were quite effective at reducing disease. One of the other things that we rapidly learned was that applying fungicides to a head is very different to applying them to a leaves. Leaves are like a laminar surface, and so the nozzles and the, um, and the direction and the types of nozzles you were using actually needed to be a little bit different to apply something um, to a head. And the other thing that we learned was that the strobil urines, this um, quadris, it became apparent after a little bit of time that something kind of funky was going on. And we recognized that while this was actually reducing disease, it was actually causing the plants to increase mycotoxin production. And so we now recommend that growers don't apply strobil urines even at a really early stage. So even applying a strobil urine fungicide at a five leaf stage can increase the toxin um, at heading. Okay? And so um, the best fungicide now um, in terms of re recommendation is generally um, Prosaro or a off, um, this is actually coming off, what do you call it? Patent. Off patent, thank you very much, off patent. Um, so there are some generics that are now available and prothioconazole, tebuconazole are the combined active ingredients in that. And we know that it actually provides pretty good protection. And by pretty good, we're still only talking about um, reducing disease levels by about 60%. Um, 60%. So the other thing that we have managed to do is also look at the timing of fungicides. So there's been a tremendous amount of work done through the US Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative looking at timings. And um, we recognize that there is for various different grain classes kind of optimal timings for these fungicide applications. And we're actually learning, um, which is fortunate, that the timing is right around mid-flowering, is the optimal timing to apply the fungicides. And we've actually learned, I think, in the last few years from putting together sort of a meta data analysis combining um, what is probably now between 50 and 60 trials conducted across the US, some data indicating that rather than having a very small window of you know, four to six days to apply it, that, that we actually have a larger window, maybe out to 10 days post-flowering in some grain classes for us to be able to get those fungicides um, on. So, and then the other thing that was really looked at, and much of this work was kind of um, pioneered by Marsha McMahon, who was the extension plant pathologist in um, North Dakota at NDSU, really looking at nozzles and directions of nozzles. And so she did a tremendous amount of work looking at that and looking at, um, volumes because often under the conditions where fusarium head blight occurs you can't even get a ground rig on so they also looked a lot at volumes um, for aerial applications as well but certainly for ground applications they recognize that if you've got a nozzle that, that faced forward and backwards you got much better coverage of the erect head than you did um, using the kind of flat fan nozzles that are directed towards covering leaf surfaces. So the other thing that really linked into the work with Fusarium head blight is that there's an opportunity with this disease to work on developing um, prediction models. And so um, there's no need to forecast disease if it occurs every year and you can guarantee it's going to be there and if you don't have any reason to utilize that data. So you want to use a prediction model where you have a sporadic disease where the plants are actually vulnerable for a short period of time, so you don't need to be monitoring disease over a very long window, and where um, you have some way of actually responding, okay? So in this case, we had fungicides that we could put on. Um, and we also know that the environment impacted the disease cycle, and, and we knew that wet weather was when we were seeing fusarium head blight um, occur.
Okay. So in the um, US, they develop prediction models um, as, and they have a disease prediction tool which actually combines a couple of different models which have been tweaked to the different grain classes. And this model is using um, critical information, primarily rainfall events, relative humidity, um, and temperature, to um, at, at specific periods during the disease cycle to predict um, host infection. And so initially they looked at a whole host of different factors that were um, affecting disease over a very long period um, in terms of the disease cycle, but they were really able to narrow it down to the period um, affecting host infection. So right at the point when the plants were most effective and the factors that were important were the temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, um, and looking at the wetness duration to kind of estimate how long the leaves are wet for. <coughs> and so um, this all got integrated into a model which is now this um, Fusarium Headblight Prediction Center um, model which is, which is now deployed in all of these states so it's not available in the western states. We didn't think we had a problem in Idaho when this was developed and we're now looking at how we expand it out that far. Um, but this is a model that has some um, pretty nice um, functions to it where you can go in and you can select the state and then you can actually select the grain class if you have winter or spring because there is a model for each of those two grain classes and then you can select the date and so this is based on when your um, crop would be flowering and then you can, after you've selected those things, you will then drill in on an individual state and it will show the risk pattern. So the red being high risk, um, yellow intermediate, and the um, green being low risk. And then um, there were also, this is using weather data through the various different systems they have for um, aggregating agricultural weather data throughout the country. And so you can actually go in and find your local, um, you can actually activate the stations and then those activate individual stations and you can actually click on those. So if you know where you're farming, you could find the closest station or if you're in between two and you know which one is more representative of the kind of weather you have, you can go to that and you can click on that and then a box will pop up that will give you some additional information. So this actually shows over the days showing that risk is you know, presently increasing and was a little bit um, lower a few days before so if your crop is flowering over a number of days you can think about adjusting what you think might be your risk um, so you would yeah click on that station and then um, there are some other options in this tab to be able to look at for additional types of information so in this you can look um, to also see the the current risk that um, the, the previous risk and then it will also um, enable you to, to utilize some weather forecasting data to be able to um, estimate if your risk is kind of increasing or decreasing at every, any given time. And so um, for chemical control, the best practices that we know are um, recommend, using the recommended fungicides for this disease of these Prosaro probably being the best, the use of an adjuvant which is helping to both stick and spread. Um, the active ingredient on the head. We know about the timing um, of it and we know um, a, a couple of things about both ground applications using those twin directional nozzles or aerial application using a small droplet size um, and in many cases if you are applying it without the aid of putting on additional water on the ground you might be able to utilize dew um, or, or rain um, to give you some additional water to help spread that out. And we've really, um, the group at the US Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative have really helped um, launch this Scab Smart platform to really help integrate a lot of this information um, for growers. But I think the piece that we're probably still um, missing the most of is, is the area um, on cultural control. And so I just want to get us thinking a little bit about that kind of big picture. Um, so residue is a, a problem and they, we really haven't effectively addressed them even though they are undoubtedly where the inoculum you know, is coming from and where it's um, developing from. So we know that the increased corn acreage is probably the driver for the increased fusarium hip blight all over the world and certainly what we've seen um, in, I in Idaho would um, back that up. 
And so um, we don't want to necessarily work against conservation tillage practices, but this is one of the reasons that we've seen an increase in this disease. And I think it's important to recognize that anytime you mess with a production system, you're going to increase um, risk of certain diseases. And certainly these residue-borne diseases um, have increased since we've had um, residues in greater proportions on the soil surface. And so with Fusarium hair blight, one of the other things that we've had to deal with, especially in the northern tiers of the US, is the fact that we have extended winters. And so the microbial breakdown um, of tissues in cold weather is a lot slower than it is in warmer parts of the world. And so what we do in one growing season for Fusarium hair blight doesn't only impact the next growing season, but, but it can actually impact three growing seasons subsequent to that because corn residues can easily be visible um, and present for that period of time. Um, and so while we think of this often in terms of cold, um, I think it's also to think about in dry regions, there's less microbial activity and things will break down a lot more slowly um, as well. And so some of the work, and this really goes back to some of the work I did with Sylvia Pereira, who was my first graduate student, is that we were able to demonstrate that fusarium residues, um, or that residues support fusarium growth as long as they're recoverable. So as, as long as we can identify residue pieces in the soil, the fusarium will be present, okay? So we know that if you bury the residue, that you get it out of the fusarium hair blight system. Probably it doesn't affect the crown rot system. It's, it's staying um, where it can affect the roots. But in terms of creating inoculum, it, it appears if you bury it, you get it out of the way. But if you're talking about multiple cropping seasons, at some subsequent crop, cropping season, even a tillage operation such as planting, which we don't think of as tillage, but it's disturbing the soil, can bring residues back up um, to the soil surface. And any residues that have been buried that can come back up um, can um, potentially lead to inoculum production. And so Fusarium graminearum, we know, is also one of the early colonizers of residue. And I would actually challenge um, folks to really think about the fact that acting as a pathogen, it actually gets in and colonizes the tissue and is maybe using those mycotoxins to colonize tissue ahead of things that it would otherwise be competing with as a saprophyte. And I think too often we think about this only as a pathogen and don't think about it um, as much as a saprophyte. I think the other issue has really been increasing residues. So we've done work and we can demonstrate that, you know, wheat and corn per unit residue really aren't very much different to one another. The difference is the corn residues are larger and they persist a lot longer. Um, and interestingly, Bt corn, which is corn that is, um, has been genetically engineered to be resistant to insect attack. Actually, the residues of that reduce insect attack as well. And it's often those little insect attack that create larger surface areas, which give microbes um, access to, to the tissue to be able to decompose. So without some of that insect damage, the decomposition of these um, Bt corn residues decompose even slower than the regular residues. And this has become a problem in some systems just because they recognize that Bt corn actually just persists and causes tillage issues as well. Um, and then as we've moved to reduced tillage systems, and in some cases, no-till systems, um, we have seen you know, an increase in, in fusarium hep blight. I think one of the pieces that we understand less well is that there's clearly um, an interaction between residue moisture and the development of this pathogen or the survival of it. And in some cases, the reduced tillage is actually worse than the no-till. And I think the reason for this is where you have no-till and you have tremendous amounts of residue, a lot of it is well above the soil surface. It's not in contact with the soil. It's not wicking moisture from the soil. Um, and so it's dry much of the time. And so it's really that residue that is in contact with the soil and wetting and drying cycles that is stimulating the development of the, the pathogen. Perhaps that stuff that's well above the soil level um, is less important. Um, so we know that crop residues um, really haven't been limiting in fusarium hep blight conducive environments. So we can go out and, and find um, regional and atmospheric populations and a group at Cornell led by Gary Bergstrom did some great work, you know, flying planes out on the Finger Lakes. And they can find, you know, Fusarium ascospores up at high levels almost everywhere in this country. And so if the conditions are conducive, it doesn't make a lot of difference. 
But when conditions over an area aren't conducive to the disease, um, that the infield inoculum can play a much bigger role. And so we think that the infield inoculum is important only in kind of conditions that would be kind of limiting and on the edge for disease um, development. And so this would indicate that some of the things that we do within a field, an individual field with tillage, may have an impact and are likely to have the biggest impact in years when disease development is likely to be um, moderate. One of the other things that we've found that's interesting is that um, the resistance we have bred for to prevent disease development in the heads and in you know, the, the toxin accumulation in the harvested grain has actually had a benefit to um, cultural control practices because it's the entire plant that is being colonized to a lesser extent in those resistant varieties. So we know that the resistance is actually infected, affecting the colonization by fusarium of the entire plant itself. And so this means that the fusarium headlight resistance is actually paying benefit in those subsequent crop cropping seasons um, as well. Um, but obviously, if we can avoid the initial colonization of the residue, um, we have a better chance of keeping fusarium out. And so we still recommend um, for cultural practices that avoiding wheat in proximity to um, cereal debris is important, although there are still plenty of the parts of this country where they are growing wheat in rotation in, um, with corn. Okay? Um, so I think one of the things that we're really um, going to need to look at in the future is looking at the management of residues in years following epidemics. So it might not be in any, you know, in every year that we have to reduce um, or help the decomposition of residues, but it certainly might be in years following epidemics that we need to do that. And then thinking about planting resistant cereals is obviously good both in subsequent years as, as well as protecting that crop um, in the year that it's planted. So just kind of finishing up, thinking about things, um, I think one of the things that we don't understand is what the contributions of each of these really are to disease control. We know these are pieces of a puzzle, um, but none of the control mechanisms that we actually have individually are by themselves effective. When we have a highly conducive environment, resistance is not enough. If we have a highly conducive environment, um, chemical control is often difficult and we know doesn't provide um, you know, complete protection either. So um, cultural practices undoubtedly have their role um, to play as well. And then I think there are probably other pieces of the puzzle that we still don't really um, understand. So I'll just kind of finishing up summarizing some, of, summarizing some of the things I've talked about. I think we've made possibly um, the biggest strides, and I think this was kind of getting back to some of the things um, that were raised in the last two weeks, about stem rust is that often the way to reduce an epidemic is to eliminate the really susceptible material to begin with. And so, um, so maybe the lesson is that you know, to control a disease from the epidemic standpoint, um, reducing the really or getting rid of the really susceptible varieties is perhaps the first step and really important. Um, we have resistance, but it's not immunity, and it's really unrealistic to think that it will alone um, eliminate the risk for fusarium head blight. So chemical control is undoubtedly needed under certain situations to control um, fusarium head blight. And we have done substantial um, things to improve both the application technology and our ability to use those fungicides um, judiciously. Um, but I think we still have some, some challenges ahead. And so we've been working in the initiative to try and understand how resistant varieties are being adopted and often um, yeah, they're not being adopted quite as widely and as well as we would like in some of the growing regions. I think the hard red spring wheat in Minnesota, North Dakota has done incredibly well at adopting resistant varieties, um, but much of the country hasn't. And so we still have some wheat classes where resistant varieties are available, but aren't being widely um, grown. And part of the problem with this is that in some markets, there's a lot of branding being done. And so a wheat breeding program will develop a resistant line and then sell it and then it's sold under a different name. And so all of the um, information that was linked to the screening and what we know about the resistance gets lost. And what's um, even more concerning is that in some situations, it'll be branded under multiple different names. 
So in order to perhaps um, hedge their risks, a grower might, gr might buy three different varieties, not realizing in fact that the seed in each of those variety labels might in fact be um, identical. And it's a really big problem in the southern part um, of the US. So I think another trick is just going to be the fact that we're dealing with small QTLs. Keeping them together is going to be a real challenge in the future, particularly when other um, disease and quality issues creep higher up the um, priority scale for, um, for the breeding programs. I think our ever increasing corn acreage is an issue and something that we're not going to be able to get rid of. Maybe the fuel price might drive that um, to change, but there's um, clearly some concern about turning the entire country into a monoculture um, of corn. And particularly because this is, this is decreasing the options that farmers have to um, find an economic crop to which they can rotate to outside that system. And then I think, you know, I haven't really dealt with it, but the idea of climate change being um, having some impact on this disease and perhaps being one of the drivers that is changing um, some of the things with the fusarium population that we've seen. So with that, um, I have kind of glossed over a lot of work that's been done by a lot of people and um, up here are going to just credit some of the individuals um, throughout the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative whose work I have um, taken and, pre and you know, kind of presented ideas from, and then of course the collaborators that I work with here um, at Minnesota, and many of the folks including some of the um, graduate students that I've had over many years um, in my lab. So with that, I will finish and open it up to questions.